Hello and welcome to Photo 150, Photo History. Um, this will be our first lecture of the first week. Um, so today, what we've got to look into, um, we're going to start a little before the beginning of photography. Um, we need to get into the historical context of when photography emerges. Um, we need to look at some of the things that were happening uh, just prior to that so we kind of understand what was this world like when photography arrived. Um, I think also if we think of history as almost being like this tapestry of all these different stories um, and events and cultures all woven together, um, when we try to take one thread of that out so we can examine it, that can be helpful, um, but it also helps to put it back in and see how it's related and connected to the others. Uh, so with that in mind, um, let's get into the historical context. Um, <clears throat> So uh, obviously there's a lot more to it than this. We have to kind of um, simplify somewhat, um, use a little bit broader brushes that we paint with. Um, but you can think of, there's really four um, major historical things that kind of happen at the same time and overlap with each other. Um, the first of which would be the so-called Age of Enlightenment, also um, known as the Age of Reason. So a really, really brief summary of this, because obviously we don't have time to um, go down the rabbit hole of, of every tangent here, as much fun as that would be. Um, the Enlightenment uh, was, there were a lot of different ideas happening in it, but it, the best way to summarize it would be that it was this um, kind of newfound belief in the supremacy of human reason and logic, um, which led to an explosion of methodical scientific thought and discovery. So at the time they had sort of codified a scientific method and um, a more logical way to approach um, problem solving, whether it uh, was in the natural sciences or other areas. Um, and this was itself a development of um, things that were happening in the Renaissance and the Reformation and the Counter-Reformation. So when we go back to that idea of a tapestry, these things that were kind of all connected to each other. Um, you know, you have reactions um, against something, things that are a development of previous ideas. So all of those kind of came together um, and coalesced in what we call the Age of Enlightenment. Um, also emerging from this was the idea that scientific progress um, and um, this you know, kind of newfound king of, of our senses, our reason and logic, those things would lead to um, moral and technological progress. So um, that's an idea we're pretty familiar with today. I think, um, you know, we still would hold to something similar to this, that, um, you know, we expect that along with our technological progress, there should be moral progress. Um, and periodically we we uh, can see examples. Um, World War I was a big one where people kind of became disenchanted with this idea. Um, <clears throat> but in general, it's something that we is familiar to us. We recognize that. Um, so here's a little summary of what I just said there. Um, some key figures to think of. Um, obviously, this is we have to go really quickly through this. Um, a big one, Isaac Newton. Um, he, uh, the work he's most known for is his Principia Mathematica. Um, so we have Isaac Newton, Immanuel Kant, a philosopher. Um, one of the works that he's most known for is his book, uh, The Critique of Pure Reason. Um, and then David Hume, The Treatise of Human Nature. Um, so there's a few, obviously there's many, many more. Um, but just to kind of um, pick out some that I think kind of exemplify this idea of scientific progress and reason. Um, next, you have the Industrial Revolution. So think for most of recorded human history anyway, um, our societies and our economies were agrarian, just meaning that um, anything you ate was grown on a farm. Um, and this farm was um, tended to by hand with lots of um, really tough backbreaking work. Any products that you, whether it was clothes, you know, um, textiles, anything um, that you used was also made by hand um, by people who were very skilled, but it was a lot of work. Um, so things happen slowly um, and with a lot of effort. In the Industrial Revolution, um, you can see how this is a direct 
um, fruit of the enlightenment. So with this, um, you know, with this new um, supremacy of human reason and logic and this scientific method, people are starting to apply this to different problems they had and trying to be more efficient. And so it started to, um, you know, machinery is being built to help make the farming easier. Um, machinery is being developed to make uh, even things that we take for granted because we never get to, to see it. Um, but just how we make clothes and fabric and thread, um, you know, think of those are addressing basics of um, what we need is food and clothing um, and machinery is being developed to make those efficient. Um, and it was able to um, make it cheaper and more people could afford it. Um, so when during this transition and it lasted into the um you know well into the 1800s um, we're shifting from agrarian economies to manufacturing economies um, this made possible a huge growth in population a lot more people are making money um, there's the possibility of even having a middle class um, and it grew quite a bit so they're also using steam coal machines um, and all these things like i said that were formerly handmade are being manufactured um, next, uh, we have, oh, and here's a, uh, here's an old image, um, of, I believe it was London during the industrial revolution. Um, and they even back then had huge problems with air pollution. Um, so here's, here's an illustration of that. Next we had neoclassical art. So this was, um, kind of reaching back and inspired by Greco-Roman art forms. Um, you think of um, politically in the French and American revolutions, um, their intellectual heritage came from a lot of Greco-Roman political ideas about democracy and um, a Republican form of government where you have representatives um, for the people. Um, so they were also reaching back to that there. Um, some big figures here, um, uh, at least art-wise, we have um, Jacques Louis David with his his most famous picture, The Death of Marat. Um, he was uh, right there in the middle of the French Revolution. Uh, again, we don't have time to go into it, but there's really interesting stories if you just go look up and read about him and and the different things that happened in France in the course of his life. He he saw a lot of French history. Um, Another Jean Auguste Dominique um, Angra, the apotheosis of Homer. So not only were they influenced by the styles of of um, the so-called classical period of Greece and Rome, um, but also the subject matter of it. So here, this is about um, the poet Homer. Um, next, our fourth one is uh, Romanticism. So this is a little bit later. This is kind of following on the heels of neoclassical. Um, Maybe we could think of this as um, it's yeah overlaps the industrial revolution. It's kind of a reaction to the industrial revolution. Um, and again, while there's lots of diversity of things that fall under this umbrella of romanticism, um, some characteristics of, of things that we classify uh, as romantic in this sense would be um, an emphasis on emotion, the individual nature, and the past. Um, so you have themes of, of beauty. Um, and when you think of the context of when it's happening in the Industrial Revolution, that's kind of a contrast with the ugliness of industry. Um, so think of just that picture we looked at um, a minute ago of um, all the industrial pollution in London. Um, they're already, you know, this thing is just getting underway and they're already realizing how it can produce a lot of ugliness, um, not to mention the conditions in the factories um, that, you know, people um, have to subject themselves to um, in order to try and make a living. <clears throat> um, some key figures here um, on the art side of it would be um, Caspar David Friedrich, his um, famous painting Wanderer Above the Sea of Fog. So you can kind of see this um, looks very different from that neoclassical. Here you have a single figure out in nature. It definitely has a more emotional feel. Um, 
we have uh, Joseph Malord William Turner, um, usually just referred to as Turner. Um, he this is well before Impressionism, but you can see how the Impressionist artists were very influenced by his treatment of color and light and atmosphere. Um, and to this day, um, a lot of um, art historians and and living artists, you know, look back at his his understanding of light and atmosphere. Um, and I think he had a really powerful grasp of it. So here we can kind of see what in paint in the world of painting, what would that romanticism have looked like? Um, in let's back up a little bit in literature. Um, for those of you who are familiar with with English literature of the time, think of like Wordsworth, um, Coleridge, and his poem "Rime of the Ancient Mariner." William Blake. Um, all of this stuff together would kind of um, eventually lead to. Uh, what in America was referred to as transcendentalism. So think of um, <clears throat> Emerson, Thoreau, Walt Whitman with their poetry, um, like Leaves of Grass, um, Thoreau's um, Unwild and Pond. So in a way, they're just um, taking romanticism even a step further. Um, so next, let's look at... Um, before photography could arise, um, there were certain discoveries in the world of optics and chemistry that had to happen or photography would never um, would never be discovered. So in 5th century China, there was a, uh, uh, a Chinese philosopher named Mo Ti who um, discovered the concepts of a pinhole camera or what we now call a camera obscura. Uh, but he, he noticed that in a darkened room with a small opening that you would see an image upside down and backwards across from that opening. Um, so fifth century was a long time ago. Sometimes it, I even wonder why did it take so long from that discovery to find all the rest of the pieces to, to, for it to come together. Um, later we have Aristotle observing a similar, um, he, a similar um, effect. He noticed the crescent shaped image of the sun under a tree during an eclipse. Um, if, some of you may remember the eclipse from just a couple of years ago. Um, if that was one way that people were viewing it indirectly was through um, leaves in trees, stand under a tree and you could watch it kind of shine through there. Um, so you have a couple of instances of people taking note of strange optical phenomena. Uh, now fast forward to 10th century AD, this is quite a bit um, later, the Arabian scholar um, Al-Hazan observed that the smaller the, the opening or the aperture um, in, let's say, a darkened room, um, the sharper the image. So um, now we're getting closer and closer to something like a pinhole camera. Um, the same phenomenon was noted in the 13th century by um, Roger Bacon. Um, and in the 16th century by Rhinarius Gemma um, Frisius. By the 1600s, um, the camera obscura was uh, had become an actual tool that artists could use um, to accurately map out perspective in paintings and drawings. So they had taken it from just being this odd thing that they noticed to, hey, let's take advantage of this phenomenon and and um, put it into a tool that we can use. So they constructed, you know, a box with a small opening in it. Um, and they could start to use it to make accurate drawings. Here's a, an old illustration of, of how that principle works. Um, you've got light coming in through a small opening or what we call an aperture across from it. Here you see the image upside down and backwards. Um, and then he's got um, a canvas or some paper affixed to the wall where he can, he can start to draw this and trace it out more accurately. 